Hello everyone, I'm John Capadonna and welcome to Irrigation for Vegetable Gardeners. Most vegetable gardeners require some kind of irrigation. In West Texas where I live, irrigation is not an option, it is essential. I want to talk about two ways to water, from the very simplest with a water hose to more complex automated drip systems. Almost everyone starts with a hose, and even if you have an automated drip system, you will want a hose for special watering chores. Any job is made easier by good tools, and watering is no exception. I have no affiliation with any of the products that you may see, and these are just ones that I've used and found to be satisfactory. There are very likely others that are just as good, and my advice is just to get the best that you can afford. It's better to spend a little more money initially than it is to have to replace an inferior product. I find having a good wall-mounted hose reel makes things much easier. A freestanding one may work better for you if you don't have a handy place to mount on on the wall. A good hose also makes things easier. I like these flexible hoses. They have no memory and so they tend to lay flat and resist coiling. The important thing is to make things easy. When things are easy, you don't avoid doing them. I find a wand type hose attachment with a removable nozzle to be the best for watering a vegetable garden. You can find wands in various lengths, but I find a 30 inch to be just right for my garden. The one shown has a grip valve that's very handy, but they, they tend to be a little more fragile than some of the other styles. I also like the ones that have the flow control valve that can be adjusted with your thumb while holding the wand with one hand. Most of them come with a shower nozzle, like the one in the lower left, but there are smaller ones available, and they work very well if you have low water pressure, and they also work very well for watering small pots. The one in the upper left is a misting nozzle, and I find them to be very handy for misting seed beds and delicate seedlings when a shower nozzle may dislodge seeds or damage seedlings. So if you only have one or two beds, a hose with a wand may be the only watering system you ever need. There's something very therapeutic about watering a garden, and it gets you out in the garden and observing things, which is important. When watering by hand, it's important not to splash water from the ground to the plant. There are pathogens which can infect your plant whose spores are in the soil. Water splashing can transport those spores from the soil to a leaf and infect your plant. This is how tomatoes get blight, which is a fungal pathogen. This is where a wand with a one-hand flow control proves its worth. You can control the volume and place the water precisely without splashing. The disadvantage to hand watering is that you have more than a few beds. It becomes time consuming and it's hard for busy families trying to get the kids fed and off to school early in the morning to take the time to water or trying to water when you come home tired after a day at work. If you only have a little to water, it may be a source of pleasurable downtime, but if it becomes a chore, it will just be another stress, and that's not what we want for you and your garden. The worst thing about hand watering is that if you go away for any length of time, you'll have to have someone you trust to water for you. And one reason a, a good hose reel and hose with a good wand is so important is that it makes it easy. And that about covers watering with the hose, so let's move on to drip irrigation. In arid locations like West Texas, drip irrigation is by far the most efficient. With drip irrigation, 
you can put the water right where it's needed. And since it drips right in the ground, it doesn't lose much to evaporation. You can install the drip line under mulch or even for even less loss by evaporation. The system shown in the photo is a simple automated drip system serving two beds. I expect this is a similar situation to many urban residential applications. And this is probably the least expensive automated option. This is a simple two-zone control that screws directly onto a hose bib or to a hose end. It's battery operated and easily programmed to handle two zones. The cost is about $60 and there are similar units for up to three zones. The fact that it's battery operated eliminates the need for any household power uh, requirement. Of course, you can design a manual drip system and while it's less time consuming because you can go do other things while it waters, you have to carefully monitor your time and if you leave town, you still have to have someone water for you. Adding a control like this one really improves this simple system, not only in terms of convenience, but in terms of accuracy. Now I have been, we, I've been using one of these for the last six months and it's performed flawlessly. They do need to be protected from extreme cold though, as freezing will damage it. Before going any further, you should know that there are a lot of options available. Most online drip irrigation sources have a DIY planning guide to help you do it, or do it yourself or design their own systems. It, it also helps to know what materials are available. And many big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's and Ace Hardware carry some irrigation supplies. The online sources even have kits which may save you some trouble in sourcing all the necessary fittings. You can combine systems to make a hybrid that may work even better for you. My system is a lawn sprinkler system that I've modified to be a drip system for my garden and it works very well, although it's not perfect. Let's talk about infrastructure backbone and start with mainline pipe. This is the part of the system that transports and controls the flow of water, but not the drip element of the system. I want to save that for last. First, let's discuss mainline. That's the pipe that is not drip line. You can use poly pipe in a roll that comes in a roll, or PVC pipe, which comes in 10 or 12 and 10 or 20 foot joints. Don't use electrical PVC because the fittings are not pressure tested for water and may leak. I think Schedule 40 PVC is the best option for large garden. Polyline is easy to use and it's probably a better choice for surface applications like the two raised beds you saw earlier in the presentation. It's also great for container gardens. The automatic controls. If you've already seen this, you've already seen the simple one, that uh, hose end one, two zone, battery operated. Well, this is an Irritrol RD series irrigation control. They come in six, nine, or 12 zone configuration. The cost varies from about $200 to $375, depending on the number of zones. There are similar products from Orbit, Rainbird, and Toro, just to name a few. They're programmable and offer a lot of flexibility in programming options. They are programmable by the day of the week or by skipping a number of days. There's an option of up to three start times each day so that you can water more than one time a day. <clears throat> there are three channels, so Three different programs can be run simultaneously. Lastly, the runtime for each zone is independently programmed. Runtime is very important because this is how drip systems become so accurate. Emitters 
<clears throat> are common to all types of drip systems. They control the flow of the water. For example, emitters come in flow rates of about a quarter of a gallon per hour up to two gallons per hour. To calculate how much water you will put down, you can multiply the flow rate by the time. Identifying the number of emitters is easy. You can just count them or you can estimate the number if you know the length of the drip line. <clears throat> if you have a 50 foot run and the emitters are spaced at six inch intervals, then there are approximately 100 emitters. There are two emitters per foot, so 50 times two equals 100. So if you have a four by eight foot bed like mine, and it has 96 half gallon per hour emitters, then it would flow 48 gallons in one hour. If I water for 15 minutes, which is one quarter of an hour or 0.25 hours, it would be 0.25 times 48 or 12 gallons. So by using this simple calculation, you can precisely predict how much you will, water you will use in a given time. You may have to experiment a little bit with it, but once you arrive at a satisfactory time, you're done for that season. Gardening in the fall takes less water, so you can change your programming accordingly. Valves and cables. The next component of the infrastructure backbone is the valves. These are 24 volt AC valves. And they're just like the ones used in typical lawn sprinkler applications. These valves are designed to be direct buried. And although I think it's a good idea to put a plastic valve box over them to protect them uh, from damage if you have to dig one up, <clears throat> set the top of the valve box three or four inches below grade and cover it up. Be sure you record the exact locations. They can be easily found by pushing a small metal rod in the ground. When it hits the lid of the valve box, it will stop so you can feel where the box is. The direct barrier cable is designed specifically for sprinkler control use. The number of conductors is calculated by the number of zones that you will use and there is one color for each zone plus a white that's a common. The conductors are 18 gauge solid. Okay, here's some installation tips. Should you elect to use an irrigation control like the Irrtrol RD, there are, they are available in indoor and outdoor units so you can locate it in a convenient location. Keep in mind that they require 120 volt household current to operate so you will need to locate the control near a convenience outlet. They do not consume much current so you can plug it in to any available convenience outlet. They do not come with a cord so you will have to install a cord and a male attachment cap. When running the cable just daisy chain between the valves. Do not cut the cable. Just form a loop at each valve. Later, when wiring the valves, you can cut the outer jacket of the cable and just pull out the white common and the color you're using for that particular valve. Then you can cut and strip those two to connect to the two wires on the valve. The wires on the valve are not marked. Don't worry, it doesn't matter which wire you connect to as long as you connect the colored wire in the cable to one of the valve wires and the white common to the other. There are special wire nuts, connectors uh, that you can use for making these connections. They're similar to regular wire nuts except for they have a little rubber skirt on them. You should be able to get them from whoever you buy your wire from. The valves are very durable. Many of mine are over 20 years old and they come with a threaded hubs or smooth hubs. The smooth hubs are designed to be glued with PVC solvent. I like to use the threaded ones and install unions on each end of the valve. 
If you should have to replace a valve, the unions make it much, much easier. Unions are a little expensive, but it's a one-time expense. You need two for each valve, so it's up to you. Well, here's a typical backbone uh, diagram for a six-zone raised bed system. The pipe back to the main water supply should be like one inch if possible. The longer the run, the more friction impedes the flow, so using larger pipe for that long run helps maintain good water pressure. And <clears throat> you can reduce the size of the pipe at the raised bed to a half inch, or you may want to use three quarter if the bed's larger than four by eight, or you anticipate having a large number of emitters. Now, I think it's wise to include a ball valve in the line where it rises up out of the ground and goes to the raised bed. If for some reason you want to cut the water off, you can. For example, if you need to work on the drip line or you want to shut the water off manually to say watermelons uh, in the last two weeks before harvest without having to reprogram the zone. Having an electric valve at each raised bed or, uh, allows the most flexibility. But in a pinch, you can do two beds from one valve, but it reduces your flexibility a little bit. Well, this is a typical layout for a nine-zone row garden. Now, note that two of the zones are for future. And if you think there's a possibility of expanding your garden, it's wise to at least install the pipe backbone and the cable to future valve locations. You don't have to install the valves, but having the, the wire and the mainline pipe run to the valve locations is a good idea and it's much easier to do while you have say you rent a trenching machine it's a lot easier to go another 10 or 20 feet than it is to rent a machine another later date and do that digging the cost of that is very little and this type of layout you could use for a very large garden like a 50 by 100 row garden and since each row is a separate zone you only need enough water volume to water one row at a time. So if you're on a pump system, you can, you can set it so that it does not draw down your tank so too fast or pump your well down too far. If you watered each row in, for 20 minutes, it would take three hours to water an entire nine uh, zone system. Okay, now let's talk about drip lines, which are the business end of the system. This is a, a typical four by eight bed that I built last summer, and I'm using quarter inch drip line with half gallon per hour non-compensating emitters spaced at six inches. I like this small tubing because it's flexible and it's easy to move out of the way when it comes time to prep the bed for planting. I, I fashioned a simple manifold from half inch poly main line and I've used quarter inch barb fittings to connect the drip line to the main line tubing using quarter inch flexible PVC tubing. I simply drilled holes in the end of the bed above the soil line and pushed the drip line through the holes where I connected it to the flexible tubing with the barb fitting. When it comes time to prep the bed, I just remove the pins holding the drip line down and I pull the loop out of the bed. And when I'm done, I just pull it back in place. It's very easy to move out of the way. That's a problem with say half inch line is much stiffer. An eight foot piece of half inch line is difficult to just move out of the way if it's connected at one end. 
note the small valve with the green handle so that I can turn the water off to the bed without reprogramming the control. Small quarter inch drip line does have some limitations. This line is limited to 30 foot runs, but some lines are even less. It's also prone to clogging with hard water scale. My solution is to keep a 500 foot roll on hand and replace the drip line as needed every two or three years. Fortunately, it's not too expensive. Drip lines for longer applications. Now this would work in applications like row gardens where rows are 30 feet, 50 feet, or even 100 feet long. For places where pressure is adequate, between 20 and 40 PSI, the best choice is Netafim Easy 12 millimeter drip line. What makes this drip line so good is that it has pressure compensating emitters that work between 6 and 58 PSI, and the emitters are self-flushing. That means that they're much less likely to clog than standard emitters in hard water applications. The 12 millimeter drip line comes with emitters installed on 6, 12, and 18 inch spacing and flow rates of 0.26 and 0.426 gallons per hour on the 6 inch spacing and 0.6 and 0.9 gallons for the 12 and 18 inch emitter spacing. So if your water pressure is above 25 pounds, you can use 12 millimeter drip line with 0.4 gallon per hour emitters spaced at six inches and be able to have rows up to 100 feet long. With the same emitters spaced at 12 inches, you could double that length to 200 feet. So if you have long runs, hard water, and decent water pressure, but not super high water pressure, I think it's worth seeking out the Netafim Easy drip line. Netafim Easy can also be buried or used under mulch. Another option where runs are long or pressure is low is drip tape. Drip tape is also very economical to use. Drip tape operates in the pressure range between 8 and 15 PSI. And there are several options, including emitter spacing and flow rate and wall thickness, depending on the brand. There are downsides, too. The ground in your garden needs to be pretty level, and a pre-filter is a must. You will, you'll need to carefully evaluate the specifications of the brand of drip line that you're choosing before buying to make sure that it's compatible with the conditions you have. If you have excess pressure, that can easily be controlled with a small inline pressure regulator. One last thing, and that's these CETA cleanable pressure compensating emitters. Now these emitters have an operating range between 5 and 50 PSI. They have a barb fitting that fits quarter inch microtubing or they can be installed in uh, blank mainline tubing at your preferred spacing. They come in half, one, and two gallon per hour flow rates. Now these emitters are great for watering containers and pots. And they can easily be disassembled by unscrewing the cap for cleaning. I've had some of these type of emitters in operation for over 10 years and they're still working well. They're a little on the expensive side, but they work very well and they're very durable. So they're very suitable for small areas, pots, and containers. Well, we've reached the end of my program and I know that this presentation may not have answered all your questions. But I hope it's given you some ideas and pointed you in the right direction to seek out the information you need for your specific project. Thank you very much for your time and attention.